So, hello, uh, this is Paul Woodadge again for World War II TV. Another evening discussion with a very exciting subject today of chemical warfare. And so my guest tonight is um, Dan Kazita. Hi, Dan, how are you doing? Hello, good to be here. And we're going to discuss, as I say, discuss this interesting subject of chemical weapons. And um, it's, a, it's a subject that I found uh, not interesting for, but it was one of those subjects I always knew about, but never really read much about until I read your book, Toxin, which is um, very good. And of course, you're covering right up to the Putin era. We're going to focus on just the World War II part of it tonight, because otherwise we'll be here for three or four hours. And uh, and we'll, we can always come back and do that later on. But um, so I'm going to start by just saying that one of the things that I found the most fascinating about your book is that the idea that the, the chemical warfare program that the Nazis set up wasn't all about killing people. There was a legitimate side to it of improving fertilizers for their self-sufficiency. So explain a little bit about, about the 20s and the 30s, exactly how this came about and what was going on in Germany. Okay, uh, one of the one of the great lessons from the First World War was how easily Germany is blockaded. It's largely landlocked. It's a handful of ports are on the Baltic or in a ver or Hamburg and Bremerhaven, uh, very easily blockaded. Uh, so Germany can be very easily cut off from imports. Uh, the other thing is the collapse the, the collapse of Germany in 1918. Uh, had a lot to do with food shortages and sailors mutinying because they weren't being fed and things like that. Uh, Germany has this idea and a valid idea that really they're only a bad harvest away from having to surrender because you have to be able to feed your people, you have to be able to feed your army. Now, also there's this idea that you know we're going to be cut off from uh, foreign imports of things like petroleum and you know things that we you know, rubber things that are have to be imported. Uh, so in the 20s and 30s, there's this whole idea that, you know, Germany has to have self-sufficiency in things. Uh, one of these areas was, you know, let's try to find import substitutions. Let's find ways to make things domestically with, you know, ingredients that we have at hand here. And this combines with this whole idea of, you know, well, you know, pesticides, pesticides and fertilizers. These are important things too. Okay. Uh, so the German chemical industry had been largely consolidated into a company called IG Farb, and it wasn't all of the German chemical industry, but it was something like 80% of it. Uh, and there was this whole effort to look into pesticides. Uh, at that time, the pesticides were either based on petroleum products, which needed imported you know, oil, and oil was gonna be needed for things like uh, aircraft fuel and to go into tanks. Uh, or it was the other great uh, pesticide of the era was nicotine, uh, but nicotine, which got, got extracted from tobacco, was dispersed, dissolved in kerosene. Okay, right. which is, again is a petroleum product. So there's this whole idea. Well, let's look into you know pesticides that are based on you know things that we can produce you know ourselves. So there was this whole branch of work into uh, a new area of uh, chemistry called the organophosphates. Uh, this work had started you know in the 1920s before the Nazis came to power. Uh, but there was this guy, Gerhard Schroeder, he was a pretty good chemist. He had started his career working on dyes, you know, for clothing and things like that, but got put into this whole, you know, pesticide work. And he was working on these organophosphorus compounds. And in 1936, he found one that was, um, well, a very, very effective uh, pesticide but one that uh, was actually too effective because it was too dangerous to handle. Even in very small dilution, it was too dangerous to handle. And so therefore you couldn't really use it in agriculture if you're gonna kill all the you know, farm laborers. Um, he viewed this as a, actually a commercial disaster. He had to move on to other things, but uh, the higher ups, the management said, oh, you know, I think the government might be interested in this. Uh, and so there is where the nerve agents came from. The mm. very first nerve agent, uh, military nerve agent significance was this compound. It was called LE-100 at the beginning and then acquired this nickname, Taboon. Uh, and it was eventually, you know, developed, mass produced in this large stockpile of nerve agents that the Germans um, sat on during the Second World War. Uh, over 12,000 tons of it manufactured. I think we'll probably get back to that and yeah. all that, but that's, there's this, so, you know, we have this whole new family of chemical weapons that came about as, as a result, 
indirectly of you know macroeconomic concerns about crop protection uh, yeah. and actually a lot of pesticides a lot of legitimate pesticides including ones still in use today stem from this original research so, 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 on, the, so on the one hand you have this legitimate um interest in in promoting what i'm going to call good science for increasing yeah. crop productivity but we haven't touched on we all touch on the fact there's the sinister side as well and although we're not going to focus very much on the first world war we just have to go back a little bit yeah. and explain that during the first world war we had the development of the the military kind of gas programs and then the, but, but they kind of that that runs sort of in parallel or with the uh, the, the fertilizer kind of program how does that how do they kind of well, when you're studying it, 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 are, they it runs, or are they the same thing it, well it's it, it's so much the same thing that the the father of chemical warfare is a guy named fritz haber um a great uh, german chemist uh got the nobel prize in chemistry but also is the father of chemical warfare he didn't get the nobel prize for that but he got it for what's called the haber bosch process which is for making ammonia which right. you know, basically being able to make ammonia is the route to most of the modern fertilizers. You know, so billions of people have been fed on the on sort of the the the, the agricultural proceeds of Haber's work. But he's also the guy that figured out how to use chlorine and phosgene as weapons and tried a couple of other chemicals, too. He tried a lot of different things. Uh, and so. There is this mixed legacy. I do these mm. interesting lectures at UCL once a year with uh, Andrea Sella, who's uh, he is to chemistry what you are to the World War II stuff, uh, you know, and you know, talk about this mixed legacy. Uh, but, you know, the First World War is an interesting situation where we have this dual uh, track stuff we have yeah. because we have all the, it's, it's, a, it's a technological war. Yeah. Uh, we have the, it's the first war in which, you know, motorized vehicles really play a, a serious part and particularly in logistics, you know, mm -hmm. uh, aircraft, uh, telegraph and radio. I mean, telegraph had been used before, but you know, these things, you know, instantaneous communication, you know, uh, you know, aircraft, submarines, all the, you know, this is also the point at which, you know, sailing ships are no more. They're now steamships, you know, powered by coal and some are starting to be powered by oil and things like that, you know. So, so chemical warfare is just another thing in that broad context of all these different new and interesting things in warfare. And I would I'd actually, I'm going to go out and make a, th make a claim here that um, all those other things were broadly successes and, you know, the, the future was seen for them. The, the, the chemical warfare at the end of the war, it was sort of, oh, well, not sure we want to do that again. Not sure it was worth the effort. Uh, uh, because I think the psychological footprint of chemical warfare in the First World War is a, was a much broader thing than the actual practical uh, effect. Uh, it's very difficult to point to a single war, uh, a single campaign or a single battle in the First World War that was decisively influenced by, by, by chemical weapons. Mm. And you look at the overall statistics. I'm going to share my screen here, if that's all right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to share my screen here. And can you see this? Uh, this guy, Dr. Gilchrist, a U.S. Army doctor, Colonel Gilchrist, did this study in the 1920s and methodically went through the number of uh, chemical warfare casualties uh, from the First World War did huge amounts of stuff. I wish I, I, sh I should have, I, I should have, uh, I could go through the whole Gilchrist study. He's got great handwritten data visualization. He clearly had an art student. Um, but you start looking at this, you know, the amount of deaths is not terribly, uh, terribly big compared to the, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 million people that died in that war. Now, a number of casualties, you know, people is, is, is significant. Uh, so, but you look at the actual number of people dead, you know, uh, Germans, 2,280 over the course of the war. Um, and part of this is, has to do with the fact that uh, France, Britain, Germany, the US, uh, very quickly developed effective countermeasures, effective, uh, uh, effective gas mass in the places where you see a lot of these deaths and a lot of these casualties, the significant ones, you know, uh, Russia, uh, Russia and Italy, mm. because they didn't have a very good of ability to uh, to rapidly field uh, uh, gas mass. The uh, first generation Italian gas mask had deficient filters and didn't really work terribly well because they were using, believe it or not, they were using walnut shells as the filter media while everybody else is using activated charcoal. Uh, 
um, wow. quite an artisanal solution that didn't work. It also explains why in the Italian campaigns, the percentage of their, their the death percentage is a percentage of casualties was actually quite, quite high. Um, but, you know, in the, in the broad context of the First World War, that stuff is, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, but it, it okay. somehow it's left this um, this legacy. I mean, I was just reminded that uh, when he was yeah. talking about that, the only World War One film that I believe was that they got, or the one they got the most complaints about when they showed it on the BBC back years ago was Fraulein Doctor, made in 1968. Mm. Because it had this horrific scene of horses wearing gas masks going across the front and all the yellow mustard gas going across. Yeah. And it got more complaints than other films. And yeah. the other films show way more death, but somehow that gas thing was the one that people complained about. So there's obviously this inherent yeah, yeah. effect it, 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 that gas is scary, gas is a killer, and it makes complete sense that we're scared of it. We could be, yeah. well, look at the fact we're in the middle of COVID 19 now. We're scared of things we can't see, aren't we? Yeah, but the, and, and, and so it's it's this dual. Uh, the, this is sort of two sides to this because you you look at uh, Robert Graves and Goodbye to All That, his uh, his memoir, The First World War. He he rates chemical warfare rather low in amongst his uh, sort of list of hazards that you know uh, he's he's written it off as a battlefield sort of condition like rats and cold weather and mud. It's just another annoyance on the Western mm. Front. You know, whether that's him being stoic, I don't think so. I mean, having read the whole book thoroughly, I mean, he, you know, he puts it in a, in, in a context. Um, I, I think some of this had to do with the, some of this had to do with the fact that um, particularly at, towards the end of the war, uh, when you do have mustard gas, which is a misnomer, mustard gas is an oily liquid. Uh, it would contaminate terrain. All right. It would make in equipment it would get your clothing dirty it would get your it would get the mud in your trenches dirty and it had a delayed effect okay so you wouldn't form the blisters till maybe hours or even a day after exposure hardly anybody died from it uh but it would leave these long lasting scars you know uh it was sort of and it was a it was an attrition weapon design yeah it, mm. it's uh you know it's hard to actually kill anybody with mustard gas, but it's 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 a it's an effective attrition agent in that it took it took guys out of the line for a month to recover. Um, yeah, but but yeah. like other things in World War One, you know, like like the aircraft, yeah. like, um, the submarine, all these things, it it's something that that all sides wish well not wish they began to improve on and tweak yeah. and get better so you know we're, yeah. we're, we're going to focus as we you know by advertising the show about the german use yeah. of chemical weapons but it, they weren't the only country doing it i mean it, no no everybody, everybody was pretty much doing it weren't they All yeah. through the 20s and 30s yeah there was a there was an arms control agreement the geneva protocol in the 1920s whereby people basically forswore first use of chemical weapons okay it didn't outlaw them uh, in terms of development or possession, it, it outlawed first use, and you, you mm. were allowed to have them as a retaliatory measure to keep the other guys from doing it. And so countries big and small had these, had chemical warfare programs that were, you know, basically just extensions of the First World War ones. Even the even smaller countries had it too. I mean, uh, Hungary, Greece, uh, Poland, uh, Sweden, uh, Belgium, the Netherlands, the, the countries that, you know, you know, we think of as uh, Yugoslavia is uh, mm. sort of second league players in the in the in the in the, uh, in, the uh, in the Second World War in terms of you know stuff. They all had their, they all had their pro they all had their chemical warfare programs as well too, uh, which you know the thing is governments were putting a bit of effort into incremental improvements into these into these programs. Mm. Uh, that's why the nerve agent thing with German uh, the German chemical industry was actually. Uh, I, it was a huge step change in the in the lethality of chemical weapons. Okay, because suddenly suddenly there is this new substance taboon, which um, is instantly well not instantly but lethal within minutes or an hour, uh, as opposed to a false gene and the other ones that might, you know might kill you in a day or two um, sort of thing. So it have an immediate uh, casualty producing effect on the battlefield. Uh, a little bit goes a long way in terms of how much agent you need to ha you know, to kill people. It's sort of a tenth or a hundredth of what you would need the equivalent in phosgene. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so you know it's 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 a fundamental improvement. But you know the Germans amassed a massive stockpile of this stuff and largely didn't use it because they knew other people had chemical weapons. Uh, 
everybody treated their chemical weapons program with a bit of secrecy, just like you would any military technology. So there's a lot of assuming that the other guy might have what you have. Mm. going. On, okay. Um, and that, you know, because you're dying to ask me, you know, you know, why did the Germans use it? Well, we'll come, I think we'll come to that a bit later. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we want to, I yeah. want to bring in the, 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 the use by the Japanese first. Yeah. I think is yeah. before we get to Nazis, I mean, and in the, yeah. in the, in the generally forgotten theater of World War II, and in fact, it actually technically predates for World War II because World War II is 39, but we yeah. have the Japanese and China. Well, and yeah, I and find that, that element from your book fascinating. So let's, let's, let's talk about their use. And the, the well, I'm going gonna, 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 gonna to throw something in there too, as well too, that sort of leads up to that. There are, there are three great incidents of chemical warfare, you know, in the interwar period. Um, and one of the first one is one that's not very well talked about. It's the Spanish. It's the Spanish in the 1920s uh, using it again in, in northern Morocco in something called the Rift War, and where they actually pioneered aerial delivery of uh, of, of, of mustard uh, at, as a counterinsurgency weapon. So there was that. There is Mussolini's campaign against Ethiopia. Yeah or prolific use of several different types of chemical weapons against the Ethiopians. That's in 1935, 1936. And then from 1937 onward, although there, you know, I, 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 I made sure I researched it to get the facts right. I got, I found a bunch of different things. You know, there, there was a lot of, there was a lot of stuff going on in Manchuria. You know, we, we think that, you know, you know, the sort of really the, Chinese, the Sino-Japanese War, whatever you want to call it, the Chinese front in the Second World War, which really started a lot earlier than 1939, started 1930, 1931. Uh, the Japanese had a quite, you know, active chemical warfare program, uh, not terribly technologically superior, basically World War One era things. Um, and they're fighting against a numerically superior but under-equipped enemy, the Chinese. Now, the Chinese had some, fra the, China was quite fragmented at the time. You had warlords, you had yeah, the, yeah. the nationalist government, the Kuomintang, you had, you, you, you had the People's Liberation Army, you know, the communists. The Kuomintang, uh, at least in theory, had a bit of a chemical warfare program itself, although, you know, records of, you know, how much that they actually got it to use and things like that is, you know, I can only really point to a few incidents of Chinese use versus Jap uh, Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the Japanese army was actually fairly well equipped with with uh, protective equipment. In fact, uh, I'm going to share my screen again because we got a great visual on this. Um, got a great visual here. Let's see if I can. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. This is the this is the Battle of Shanghai, uh, where where phosgene and you know, uh, chlorpicrin and a few other chemicals were prolifically prolifically used by the Japanese. Um, there were there are many hundreds of incidents of chemical warfare use uh, in the in the in the Sino-Japanese uh, conflict. Uh, various sources, you know, I mean, the sources vary on this. You know, I can't really effectively do the historiography on this because I can't read Chinese or Japanese, and that's where the that's where the info is. Yeah. Um, but there there are figures uh, figures mooted like you know. 10,000 deaths and 80,000 uh, 80, wounded, uh, you know, Chinese and, you know, hundreds of hundreds of Japanese dead and, you know, several thousand Japanese wounded in some cases by friendly fire or ships in the wind and things like that. So when you get to the levels like that, you get to a point where that's numerically as significant as the Western Front in the First World War. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I'll, yeah, we don't really talk about. It. Well, generally speaking, this China-Japan stuff is not really talked about much in you know when 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 us sort of Westerners talk about the Second World War. Well, because they're I mean, not white. Same with the Ethiopians. It's, I mean, in a, in a thing yeah. that, uh, we, we tend to focus on our own our own uh, cultures, and yeah, the Japanese, Chinese. It's who cares? I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. Or, you know, or we do talk about it. We talk about you know the flying tigers. Flying, I knew. I, I was just thinking flying tigers. Yeah, we talk about the bit that connect us, don't we? Although, yeah, of course, now the, the Burma Road bringing, or flying the over Chinese. the hump, all that stuff. Yeah, they're bringing uh, the Chinese in now because they're funding war films, aren't they? So now there's always, a, I mean, Midway had the whole um, Chinese on the on the ground with Doolittle, but because the Chinese funded the movies. So anyway, we're yeah. doing, and, but yeah, no, I mean that. 
So that use there was was you know was was on a, on a seriously large scale. If you, if it was ten thousand deaths, that's 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 significant, isn't it? Oh yeah, and I find this uh, there, there was this guy. There was Brigadier General John Middleton of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps, uh, who was sent to be the chemical warfare advisor to the Kuomintang to Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, uh, and it's interesting enough, he was a member of my American Legion post. That's another story. Mm. <laughs> so, so, you know, there was this American advisory effort to help our Chinese allies. So, yeah, there is this whole thing out there. It has a legacy to this day because the issue of abandoned and uh, abandoned Chinese, uh, sorry, abandoned Japanese chemical munitions is a huge issue in Chinese Japanese relations to this day. Right. Because stuff gets dug up a lot. All right. A lot of stuff was simply abandoned, but also famously chemical weapons, you know, chemical artillery shells and aerial drop bombs have a higher dud rate than their conventional alternatives. Right. Uh, uh, so if you fire 100 sh chemical shells in a battle, some of them are going to be duds stuck in the mud there. And, you know, mustard, for example, is famously persistent. You know, mustard sealed up in an artillery shell is still problematic to this day. Yeah, well, that's the, the stuff on the Somme when they find that they still get spooky yeah. about, isn't it? They're not worried about grenades and things. They're yeah, used to that yeah, now. But anything yeah. with mustard gas, you get the problems, you get the issues. That's that's the first thing they, yeah. uh, they're worried about. So, I mean, it, to, this this is... I'm finding this fascinating and 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 you're going to bring it up later on but this I think you've already touched on it in there that with the chemical weapons and and nerve agents it's always the disposal after a conflict yeah. if a war ends and you've got lots of surplus battleships you can cut them up you can break them down or you can mm. just leave them they're not going to harm anybody yeah but with anything chemical and we'll touch on that as it goes on yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, too, it, you know you can't just unreduce it yeah, it becomes a serious mess. You know, the, 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 the legacy of it is, is, is a problem. You know, chemical weapons are like landmines. That, you know, so, yeah, whatever utility they have on the battlefield is, you know, is, is, is what it is. But you have this long shadow cast by them that, you know, that conventional weapons which, uh, don't have. A bayonet is a bayonet. It's a knife. Yeah. You yeah. know, a torpedo is a torpedo. Uh, you know, a bullet, is, a bullet has been fired, has been fired, but this stuff casts a long shadow, you know. Yeah. So, so where do you want to go from here, Paul? Well, let's 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 talk about Poland in 1939. I think is the next thing before we bring the Nazis in and um and and talk about an incident that happened then that is 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 relevant to our discussion. Yeah. So again, I, I mean, even with the Chinese stuff, I look. I hope that I've put sort of put a fork in the idea that there wasn't chemical warfare in the Second World War because there was. Uh, but uh, there largely wasn't in Europe, uh, but yeah. we, it almost went there, okay? Uh, Poland had a chemical warfare program, not a terribly big one, but it had a chemical warfare program in the 1930s. Um, in early 19, in the early, early September 1939, a few days after the, um, the German invasion, there was an incident in this place called Yazwo, uh, in sort of south, it's it, it's it's in south at the time south central Poland. Now it's sort of southeastern Poland. But the footprint of Poland that was shifted after the yeah. war by Stalin numerous uh, times. Yeah. Some people, the whole country got shifted. Um, there was an incident where some mustard gas filled landmines were left to booby trap a bridge, and it's the very same bridge here pictured. All right. Yeah. Um, as best as anybody could tell, it was actually quite diluted mustard. Uh, and the German army immediately investigated. Uh, in fact, this whole thing comes out of this interesting book here, The History of G uh, German Chemical Warfare. Um, I, this guy, Hermann Oxner, who was, he was the head of chemical warfare offense and defense for the German army for the entire war. All right, so he, he, sent a, he immediately sent some scientists to go investigate this incident. Said, yeah, indeed, there were some guys. I think there were 14 uh, soldiers hospitalized with, uh, with mustard gas burns and all that. Uh, but they actually quite quickly uh, deduced that this is really a local initiative. wasn't a Polish, you know, wasn't a Polish, you know, change in policy. Right. Uh, that a particular local chemical unit of the, of the Polish army had some dilute mustard, which they they would use for things like testing uh, chemical detection or uh, as a simulant in training. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they use this for lack of anything else to sort of interdict this particular bridge. 
And so, you know, we're all about picking on the Germans in the Second World War, rightly so. But one good thing that they did is General Oxner and his guys very quickly tapped this down. Hey, this is a local thing. This is a one off incident, you know. Uh, you know, we're, let's not, you know, we're winning this war against Poland. Let's not just start dumping gas into this whole thing. Let's take a step back from it. So there was a bit of, you know, there was some, there was some sense prevailing here, uh, you know, in, in form of the, you know, the, the, the German military saying, you know, yeah, okay, there was this incident, but, you know, this is, this really was a one-off. Uh, I mean, this, the, when you talk about the, the, you know, the Germans sort of almost, uh, playing it down is that because some of these gentlemen well, i'm gonna use the word gentlemen in its loosest connotation because they're kind of fearful of of the of the escalation for their own safety or or is it more of a, a, a worried about what the implications for mankind where where does it sort of sit is it well it's it's, it's interesting because you read this whole this this guy oxner obviously got captured at the end of the war uh he got commissioned by this the the, the the historical office of the office of the chief of the chemical corps to write what was then a classified study uh, about, you know, he writes this sort of 80 page monograph and a lot of questions are put to him. And he sort of spills his, his he's, you know, he, he's written, he, he's writing this several years after the war. He's spilling the beans, you know. Um, he comes across as like having a little bit of an inferiority complex, basically convinced that uh, the French, the Germans, the Americans, uh, even the Italians uh, have got better offensive and defensive capability and that the Germans are really pushing hard to catch up. Mm. OK. Um, he, you know, he knew even in 1939, he knew the, the, these thing called nerve agents. He also knew that they existed in sort of, uh, you know, vials. Yeah, you know, you know, not mass production. That it was exactly at the point when this incident was going on that the the uh, guys from IG Farben are, are going up to Berlin with you know, you know suitcases full of uh, you know uh, presentation materials and all that, saying, "Now is your chance. You're going to give us a lot of money, and we're going to build a big uh, we're going to build a big uh, chemical warfare factory for you." Uh, but at this particular time. Uh, you know, Oxner is struggling to field enough gas masks to his entire entire large army because guess what? Rubber is in short supply. Oh, you of course, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, nobody had really figured out. Another thing is nobody had really, really figured out how really, truly, adequately to protect horses and and mules and donkeys. And we forget at our peril how much the German logistical stuff was. Uh, oh yes, on really. animals. 800 German horses per division, generally. Yeah. Not, that's a Normandy fact. 864, I think. It yeah, is. I, yeah, I, I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's true, but the sort of the captured German staff officer looking at this invading army in Normandy and saying, where are your horses? And the Americans saying, we don't have any. He's like, ah, that's it, we're done. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, for, all, for all the popular stuff about horses wearing gas masks and stuff like that, you know, it's hard to actually get a horse to exert heavily under any gas mask. Mm. Uh, uh, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing. And the, you know, the German army relied heavily on it. So if, if part of your logistics relies heavily on uh, equine, you know, uh, resources, it's like, you know what, it's probably in the best national interest that we really don't go into this mass chemical warfare thing. Uh, but then they do, though, don't they? So let, let's let's talk about the fact they there yeah. obviously is a big a big chemical program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that kind of start, and who is the main person behind that? And and just okay. run through through some of that with us. All right, I've, I've changed the slide here, but so what you have here is an aerial photo of the first nerve agent factory, in a place called uh, Dyernfurth. It's uh, it's now in Poland. At the time, it was in, a, in an area called Silesia, which again, due to shifts and borders, is now in Poland. Um, I.G. Farben convinced the high command, uh, the German high command, to underwrite a large scale program to, well, to do several things. One was to greatly, imp greatly increase production of the First World War era uh, chemicals, phosgene and mustard and hydrogen cyanide and all these other things that worked with varying degrees of success in the First War. Right. Um, but also to plow a huge amount of money into uh, this new nerve agent. Uh, they had this they had this new nerve agent called Taboon. Uh, by the time the war started, there was another more deadly one uh, called Sarin. Uh, they hadn't quite figured out really how to mass produce it, but they had worked out a mass production process for for Taboon. They just needed to scale it up. Uh, and so 
there was this guy who might go down as I should have I should have brought up a photo of this guy Otto Ambrose. Uh, he probably he's literally the A in Siren. Siren is an acronym. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, he goes down as quite literally, you know, and I'm going to stop sharing uh, my screen here because I think I could probably find a, a, a thing of him while we're talking here. Otto Ambrose goes down in history as perhaps one of the more wicked chemists, you know. Uh, he, he wasn't an inventor of any of this stuff, but what he was, he was the industrialist, you know. Oh, there I got it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to share his, uh, I'm going to share his, uh, his uh, his um, picture here. All right, let's see. If I go back. Share screen. Share screen. There we go. There's Otto Ambrose. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I wasn't expecting someone who looked quite like a kindly uncle like that. I was expecting someone looking really awful. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Well. He was the industrialist that made it all happen. And he was also one hell of a grifter. All right. Uh, here's the thing. Once the war started, you know, anything that was defense related was really was really like the money cow. OK. Mm. For, for German industry. Otto Ambrose and I, you know, I, I rarely use the word cabal, but I, I think it really it, it fits here. A cabal of other industrialists, you know. You know, upper middle and upper management, not the not the actual sort of frontline chemists, but these middle and upper management guys f formulated this big industrial scheme to suck money out of out, out of uh, out of Berlin and into their own pockets. And part of that was was this cunning wheeze to make nerve agents and sort of working it out so they you know they didn't have to pay tax and they right. set up a bunch of. Um, they set up a bunch of front companies to circulate money in funny ways and, and use German corporate law to their own advantage. You know, somehow Otto Ambrose had 16 jobs all in full salary during the war. And he was very busy. Mm. Every one of these front companies had to have a board of directors. And, you know, guess whose name is on all of it? Otto Ambrose. You know, uh, I say he's a wicked chemist because actually his legacy after the war was after, you know, he got out of jail. He ended up being part of the guys that developed thalidomide. Oh, OK. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Fine. Wow. Yeah. OK. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So there's a special place in hell for Otto Ambrose. Yeah. Let's hope um, so. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because uh, chemical warfare wasn't his only wheeze. Uh, one of his other wheezes was synthetic rubber. Uh, you know, quite good at it, but, you know. Uh, his synthetic rubber plant was at a place called Auschwitz, and he used an awful lot of slave labor. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I knew that was going to come up in the conversation. Yeah, yeah. that's what I mean, did. For, that's that's what did for Otto was his slave labor used at Auschwitz, not any of his chemical warfare stuff. Because uh, what you have is you have this, as, you know, I, he was getting rich off of it, but he's and he did have his sixteen jobs on paper, but he really was working very hard. I've been through many hundreds of pages of his documents. I mean, I've been through. Um, the, you know, the, the contents of his waste paper bins uh, are cataloged down in uh, the National Archives in Kew. So you can go through all his rubbish, you know, and there it is, his dry cleaning receipts, you know. Wow. He was very well dressed. Uh, I've seen his receipts, you know. Uh, I've seen, you know, you know, thousands of pages of documents that get captured off the guy. Um, he, he built this industrial empire that really did build, you know, make 12,600, 12,800. The exact total is a little bit, you know, up in the air, tons of taboon, which is a lot of taboon. Mm. They built this large factory in, in Silesia to produce it. And they were trying to mass produce sarin and just not getting there because sarin is a much more difficult, you know, it's a fundamentally more difficult process. And the, even at the end of the war, they were still struggling with, with how to make it and, you know, all that. But so what they ended up doing, they had a lot of stuff. Okay. They had, a, you know, they had a lot of this nerve agent taboo and they had it filled at 80 percent of it was filled into aerial bombs and about 20 percent of it was filled into uh, 105 and 150 millimeter artillery shells um which and it was stockpiled but it was stockpiled it was not forward deployed anywhere they made sure it didn't leave continental germany so it's not like stockpiles of this stuff went forward into france mm. or into into the Eastern Front. It stayed close to home in, in, in well-guarded secret depots. Um, 
But also, so the burning question is then at this point is if hmm. they're producing all this stuff, you know, you know, what I'm going to ask why, why yeah. didn't it get used? Well, uh, for, for, for one thing, um, well, there were several, there were several, there were several factors by the point at which I think it might have made a difference. Uh, you have to, under, I have to understand this, this total production figure dates up to about January of 1945, but full production wasn't. Initial production was going on in 1942, and they had a lot of problems. It wasn't until about 1943 when they're actually getting the full swing here. Right. Okay. All right. Now, and then 80% of it is going into aerial drop bombs at a point at which, you know, the Luftwaffe doesn't have much strike capability anymore. And what's left of the right. Luftwaffe yeah. is trying to do tactical work or is trying to do reconnaissance, is trying to protect the homeland, you know, uh, you know. Uh, strategic bombing is no longer really a thing that the Luftwaffe does right. by 1943, 1944. So, you know, because IG Farben is still working to its original 1939 contract, putting 80% of the stuff into aerial drop bombs. Okay. Uh, and also 20% of it is in artillery shells, but nobody in the German army is training on how to use these artillery shells. Uh, you know, I mean, it could have been done, but you know, it would have been a, this is also a point at which, you get to 1943, 1944, uh, American and British strategic bombing is really stressing the transportation networks. You have to yeah. question whether, yeah. you know, a major effort to take new weapons out of depots in central Germany and get them out to France or out to the Eastern Front, uh, is, that, is this going to be discovered? You know, mm. is this going to be interdicted by uh, Allied bombers? And the answer is probably yes probably to yes. both of them. Yeah. Okay. So, so what you're saying is it's not necessarily because of um, uh, an unwillingness to use them. It was just the practicalities of actually using them in the way they were developing them became became difficult for them. And I guess as the war goes on, you get to 45. Yeah. Um, by then, the, the, the battlefield is on your own doorstep. So using yeah. chemical stuff then becomes yeah. much more risky because of the, of the you know, the wind yeah. changing kind of um, ideas. So, yeah. um, so, so at the point at the point at which it could have made a difference, say, Normandy, for example, um, First of all, there was this great deceptive effort to, you know, you know Hitler was convinced it was going to be the pot of clay, not Normandy. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, a 105 millimeter artillery shell only flies, you know, what, eight, nine miles, something like that? Yeah, about that. Or, yeah. 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 Uh, so even if they had forward deployed their, their nerve agent to the pot de Calais, they're stuck in the pot of clay. They're not in Normandy. OK. And 80 percent of the inventory is in these depots to go on to bombers that don't exist anymore. You know, flown by pilots that have long since been retrained to fly you know, uh, you know, Falk Wolf 190s and ME 109s mm -hmm. to protect the Reich. <laughs> okay, so there, there becomes this logistical impossibility to use it, okay, at least on, at least on the Western Front, you know. Um, but then there's also, there's, there is a political factor involved too. That same guy, Otto Ambrose, he is absolutely convinced that the Americans and possibly the British have nerve agents. Right. Okay. Okay. You know, uh, he's convinced that the advanced state of American industry has has probably come around to the same thing. You know, he he makes that assumption for the wrong reasons, but you know, he 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 does understand that the likes of Monsanto and Dupont and Shell Oil are bigger and more technologically advanced than IG Farben. This is well established. Mm, yeah. Okay? Yeah. And they're far bigger. And the you know they're out of range of any sort of you know German you know attack, yeah. Uh, but also the Germans the Germans have spies, okay. Uh, and you know German espionage didn't live up to its uh, its uh, reputation in the war, but certain things were going on. You know, you have places like Bern, Switzerland, and. Buenos Aires and Stockholm, where you have German diplomats and spies working under diplomatic cover in these embassies in these neutral countries. And these guys can go down to the libraries and the university libraries in particular, or in Bern, go to the patent office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and look at what's in the chemistry journals. Okay. They, and these guys have a long, you know, they've got a long sort of, you know, fishing list, if you will, a shopping list of things that, you know, uh, that they're scouring the Western, you know, scientific publications for. And interestingly enough, practically the minute after the U.S. gets into the Second World War, every article in all the American publications, all the technical publications on pesticides disappears. 
Ah, uh, right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So Otto adds two and two and gets six. Now the reason why mm. that stuff all disappears is the Americans are safeguarding their method to mass produce DDT. Now DDT is not an organophosphate. It's a different class of chemicals, but DDT is hugely beneficial to the American war effort because you start thinking about North Africa, the Panama Canal, mm. the entire South mm. Pacific, all these places where malaria, yellow fever, dengue, uh, yeah. typhus, you know, all these things that are spread by insects, you know, yeah. a pesticide yeah. like uh, DDT is absolutely critical to the war effort. And so all the American stuff gets censored on the basis of protecting DDT. Now, Ambrose sees that, oh my God, all the American stuff on pesticides dried up. Our stuff came out of pesticides. He sort of he also knows that there was this guy in Britain named Saunders that was doing some work roughly in organophosphates before the war. And so he sort of puts this together and he, he assumes that the Americans must have this. Uh, and, and actually, you know, he tells Hitler this. Hitler puts a question straight to him. Otto, you know, by the way, here's your, here's your great, you know, here's your great medal and here's a huge cash bonus for all this lovely work you're doing. What do you think? You think the Americans have this? And he says, yeah, I think the Americans have this. Wow, that, now that's fascinating, yeah. Yeah, now how much of this is Otto bigging himself up after the war? Because, you know, Otto Ambrose's best fan was Otto Ambrose. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, but clearly that's what he told his interrogators. And his interrogators, uh, he, had, he had one of the great interrogators go at him, a guy named Edmund Tilly, who came at him several different ways. Uh, this British guy, Edmund Tilly, you know, really tripped him up a couple of times. Uh, uh, Tilly believes that Otto was sincere on this and not sincere on some other things, but yeah. Um, uh, Albert Speer, you know, was full of, you know, was full of sort of mistruths about chemical weapons in the war and all that too, but you know. Um, but, you know, so there's this idea that, well, we better keep these nerve agents as a reserve to retaliate against the Americans in case they start. Mm. And then there's this whole idea, well, you know what, our chemical industry, our factories where we make this stuff, we're hiding them, but they're still in the range of Allied bombers, but we can't touch any American factory. Yeah. You know. Uh, I, as you were talking, I was thinking that, that G Germany's own geography is mm -hmm. making them the most difficult nation to use chem chemical warfare because they're surrounded by the people they're trying to kill. So well, yeah. if, if, if a country was going to use it, the USA had more freedom to use it because they could have used it against europe and said okay we don't care it's miles away from well, us it's a it's a yeah 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 exactly and it's um and i i, I think if the if germans were going to use it at all they weren't going to use it in the west they're going to use it in the east where they were greatly outnumbered mm. you know so and they didn't um the question is the question comes up would it have changed the war um you know, the funny thing, at the point at which it would have changed the war, it would have just delayed the inevitable. Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. we have to also put these things in context. There was this thing called the Manhattan Project. Okay, yeah, going on. Yeah, so yeah. what does a so look at the chronology of the Second World War? What does a four or five month delay in the defeat of Germany get you? It gets a first atom bomb on Berlin instead of Hiroshima. Yeah. Is exactly what it gets. Yeah. At least theoretically, yeah, 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 yeah. The threat of, the threat of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I, I make a contentious point that I think actually, you know, chemical warfare shortened the war in the West uh, because the amount of resources that and uh, and and capital and knowledge and technology was being sucked up into this uh, into this chemical warfare program rates into the, you know, many billions of dollars of pounds by today's money. It was a vast industrial complex. Uh, so, uh, some of the best minds in Germany were working on this stuff uh, and basically taking these resources uh, and sequestering them from, from actual use in the war. Mm, well, that, that's happening university with the Germans, isn't it? By 40, yeah. in that they've got at various points where they've had a nuclear program or atomic program, they've got yeah. their jet jet program, they've yeah. got their super tanks, they've got their art. They're working on so many different things. Of course, they're just paying Peter to pay, 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 pay Paul, aren't they? they? They haven't got the money to work at all of them at the same level. So they're yeah. all being pushed on kind of yeah. a broad front, but not yeah. actually getting any of, the, any of them finished. 
And some of them were really crazy. There was this, uh, you know, there was this other strain of the German chemical warfare program working this really, really horrific chemical called chlorine trifluoride. Uh, uh, it, let's put it this way. It burns glass and sets concrete on fire. Okay. Wow. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, truly okay. horrific stuff. All right. But they couldn't find a way to really sort of contain it or use it at all. The idea was they originally were working on the idea that they could use it to, uh, uh, reduce the Maginot line, you know, literally bore, burn holes in the bunkers. And it probably wow. could have, but you know, my God, you know, just dealing with stuff, you know, I mean, yeah, there, there are hundreds of millions of dollars equivalent when, you know, pissed away in that program. So, you know, if, if Otto Ambrose and his cabal of chemists had been working on, I don't know, something more sensible, like taking, you know, coal and turning it into petrol, <laughs> yeah, now that would have made a difference, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. You know. So they're spreading themselves too thin, is what you're saying. Essentially, they're 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 yeah. they're, they're they're not they're struggling. So, um, I've just I'm looking at the list of things you want to talk about. Yeah, I'm already for you. So, um, let's talk about um the SS John Harvey, and I'm changing subject completely. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Let's go to Italy. Okay. So the. So so basically well, we had yeah. we and just a point we had some people on the YouTube actually mentioning that so that's yeah why yeah that's a good point all right so for 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 what for your listeners who don't necessarily understand the SS John Harvey uh, was a was a U.S. freighter full of mustard gas bombs the M forty seven aerial delivered mustard gas bomb and it was in Bari Harbor at a point at which the uh, I'm going to go back on myself and say, yeah, I, I said that the uh, Germans didn't have much strike capability uh, in terms of airstrikes, but they scraped some up and did this excellent air raid on, on Bari Harbor. Um, and I'm not sure on the exact date of this uh, off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. Uh, but the, the, the Bari Harbor incident, um, you know, this ship to John Harvey got struck by bombs and sank and dispersed rather large amount of sulfur mustard, which it was the proper name of mustard gas. Now, why was it there? It's because the U.S. the U.S. is forward deploying mustard uh, in case it is needed, because the U.S. Army Chemical Corps is on a hair trigger to switch over to offensive chemical warfare should the Germans or the Italians or some, you know, you know mm. decide, decide to get desperate. And so the entire war in, in Europe, the 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 the, uh, the the U.S., the Brits, to a less extent than the Soviets, are basically just waiting for the Germans to be desperate enough to use chemical weapons, okay, and ha and have their own chemical weapons ready to go just in case that happens, okay. So in uh, so, a sense, stick, sticking to the, the 1920s kind of 1930s agreement, the kind of the yeah. gentleman's agreement, we won't use it first, but we've got it in case you use it. Okay. Yeah, and the U.S. did a lot to forward deploy this stuff. And in, in, the, in the air raid on Bari Harbor, uh, the Germans got lucky and dropped some bombs on the SS John Harvey, uh, which sort of exposed the fact that these chemical weapons were forward deployed, which I don't even think was a huge secret at the time because uh, rather large, I mean, there were a lot of uh, units of the U.S. Army Chemical Corps that were sort of dual dual purpose. They were fielded in the, uh, they had these things called chemical mortars. That chemical mortars, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did a whole Twitter thread of chemical mortars. I could do an entire entire. If you really want to go down chemical mortars, I could do an entire podcast with you on that someday with some great visuals. But well, I mean, just briefly because it's one of those things. That I, I long story short, there was a there was a, a fraudulent veteran in normandy who claimed to be 82nd airborne who wasn't and the mm. case broke about 10 years ago and it turned out that he was in chemical mortars and all the people who had broke the story they all knew what paratroopers were and everybody didn't quite know what chemical mortars were yeah going, well it's a mortar that fires chemicals and you're going no that's so just briefly just why as it came up just briefly in a nutshell what's the layman's idea description of what a chemical mortar is a chemical mortar is like a normal infantry or artillery mortar. Uh, it was the 107 millimeter or 4.2 inch, and also known as the four deuce. It yeah. was designed by the U.S. Army to rapidly lay either smoke screens or mustard gas. Um, however, it was quickly discovered that it was actually very, very good at firing conventional rounds as well, too. So the U.S. Army rapidly developed a high explosive round for it. Uh, and these chemical mortar battalions were very, very useful as sort of a division commander's sort of hip pocket artillery um, because 
their logistical footprint was less than a you know a howitzer b- b- battalion yeah. or things like that. Uh, the chemical mortars could be disassembled and you know you know carried around on jeeps or even man packed if necessary. Uh, the the ammunition was lighter than you know, than than. than regular sort of tube artillery, you know, stuff. Mm. And they could achieve a very high, highly uh, high rate of fire and very high accuracy. So these chemical mortar rounds, uh, chemical mortar battalions were, you became very popular amongst sort of division and core level commanders as, you know, as a tactical asset. Plus their actual, one of their original missions of being very good at, uh, very quickly laying large area smoke screens too, which is something that- Yeah, the smoke, and normally a particular smoke screens. And yeah, uh, yeah it was, was very important. And that, I, I always think they're very much like an equivalent of those sort of German heavy barreled mortars. They're like a, a quick joker you can play in the card the game quickly, as you say, that, that you don't have to call up artillery. They're they're a, they're a, they're, a, they're a swift response to things. So yeah, but that's yeah. Quite a good one. so the John Har- going back to John Harvey because we went off on tangent there. That was quite a tragic tragic loss of life there, wasn't it? Yeah, and the and the U.S. was paying off disability claims to Italian civilians for decades after that. And it was a bit of an embarrassment. I have to I have to admit I don't I uh, I have forgotten many of the details of the John Harvey guys, and I should have boned up on it for this. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of Dave uh, Collins, who's one of my viewers, says it was over a thousand Allied soldiers and Italian civilians were killed during that raid. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, and I, I'd, I'd say um, only a fraction that had to do with the John Harvey because there, if you look at the whole sort of butcher's bill from that, uh, dozens of ships were sunk, uh, dockyards were set on fire, so uh, a high percentage of that would be conventional. I don't know okay, where the breakpoint yeah, yeah, is yeah, for that, but where yeah, you draw the line. Yeah, okay, it yeah. was yeah, it was a quite it was quite uh, successful air raid by the by the Luftwaffe. Yeah. So let, let's let's bring it back to the. Um, uh the, the the fact the germans didn't use these weapons thank thank god um mm-hmm. so the 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 war in the the, the west and, the, and east you know in may 45 there's now well a, a shitload of chemical weapons that have been made and never used what happened to them and then also leading off from that how might they have been used in the pacific theater how, you know we now know you mentioned the manhattan oh. project that we used atomic warfare against Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but if we had attacked Japan over land, might we have started using chemical weapons there? So let's, the two of the questions are, what happened to the ones in stuff in Europe? And then what about the Pacific? Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in reverse order. Fine, that's fine All with right. me. The, the Pacific, yes, it was very much a serious consideration that chemical weapons were going to be needed to invade the, uh, the, uh, the, the Japanese mainland. Um, not mustard per se. Mustard is a persistent sort of contamination of terrain agent. It's not the sort of thing you want to advance into. You don't ever want to use mustard on stuff. Mustard is like this tru- truly pessimistic weapon. Um, so, there, but there was look at there was there was talk about you know for example lots of phosgene. Okay, but then this leads into there were lots of plans. Now, how how elaborate these plans are is sort of a subject to debate. There are some white papers in the archives with sort of, to this day, you know, you know, paragraphs blanked out. But this Mm. is going to lead into the this is going to lead into the uh, next discussion, because, you know, as you know, the war in Europe ends before the war in uh, Japan. Yeah. So it's April 1945. The war is almost over. Uh, Everybody, East and West is looking at this new nerve agent stuff that they just captured going, holy shit, what the hell is this? We've never seen anything like this before. Oh my God, what is this stuff? Okay. Uh, one of the very first things that anybody does is the Americans take some samples of taboon and sarin. There wasn't much sarin to go around, but you know, they, uh, they, they had they, sort of a jug of it, but yeah. a bunch of artillery shells full of taboon and they sent it to Boston. Okay, uh, they sent it to MIT. Okay, where mm. uh, a chemistry lab there has effectively been nationalized during the war, and uh, a captain and a and a lieutenant uh, with the Army Chemical Corps evaluate this stuff. And one of the things they evaluated against is, let's evaluate this stuff against all of our own and all of our allies and all of our known chemical protective equipment and detection equipment and decontamination, all that. Um, and so, first of all, they discovered actually you know, U.S. or British gas masks will protect against the nerve agents. So that's when these myths say, oh, my God, the Germans would have killed us all because the gas masks wouldn't have worked. That turns out to not be true. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know how well they worked against the captured Japanese masks because that bit of the study to this day is still redacted. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So uh, I, I don't really know how good Japanese gas masks were. It's not a field of 
you know, inquire I've gone down, you know. Um, so, so there was definitely some consideration to using these captured German munitions in the Pacific campaign. Uh, but planning didn't get very far on that because, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened. The, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so these planning efforts only got so far when they, when they got, you know, overtaken by events. Yeah. But, but this leads to the other thing. What you get is you get Russians, you get Brits, you get uh, Americans, you get French, all of whom are like looking at this nerve agent stuff uh, with sort of, you know, envy. Okay. Uh, and so you probably, what you had, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an oversimplification, but I think I make it clear in the book. Um, the, both sides capture stuff. Both sides capture artillery shells and bombs and have physically have this stuff. Um, that doesn't mean you can make it, okay? Uh, the, the Soviets have captured the under construction, you know, siren factory, which probably wasn't going to work anyway, right. uh, because they were going down kind of the wrong path on that. Uh, but they didn't know it at the time. Uh, more importantly, the West didn't know that at the time either. They also captured the Taboon plant in Dyernfirth. Now, the West assumes that these plants were in more useful shape than they actually were. They were both quite heavily demolished. And not only that, the Germans left a fake notebook for the Russians to find, so the Russians are going down their own path. But the Americans and the Brits don't know this. What the Americans and the Brits have, they have the majority of the documentation because rather a lot of the documentation ended up in this place called Raubkammer, uh, north of Munster, okay, uh, which is the testing ground and proving ground for these things. And they have most of the scientists, because most of the scientists, you know, fled west. They've got Gerhard Schroeder, who, the guy who invented the nerve yeah, agent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he's, yeah, he's actually a, he's not a bad guy. I, you know, I, I think he's quite embarrassed about his role in the nerve agent stuff. He just wants to make pesticides. So, he sings like a canary to his interrogators, you know, as, as several of the other guys do. Otto, Otto Ambrose is running around hiding, you know. He makes a very good, you know, effort to hide, you know. Uh, I so wrongly suspect that the French actually had him for a bit and were interrogating him. He was probably, I think he sold a lot of stuff to the French. Not mm. stuff, but ideas. Uh, yeah. There was a cunning plan, you know, there, there, there was a cunning plan. This American guy, Colonel Tarr, uh, wanted to spirit him away to the U.S. Uh, the British weren't having it. Uh, you know. But the thing also, Otto Ambrose was the middleman, the grifter, the industrialist, the accountant, all that. You know, I think you could hold a gun to his head. He wasn't going to tell you how to actually make sarin. <laughs> okay, mm. <laughs> you know, uh, he, he's only going to tell you in broad terms how to make taboo. So, so what you had is both sides, east and west. You know, they had part part of the they had part of the picture and assumed that the other side had a bigger part of the picture. And so what you get for the, literally the next 30 to 40 years after that, you know, East and West are both convinced that the other side is further ahead in a chemical arms race. In, in reality, the West was further in the chemical arms race all the way up to 1970. And then it was the other way around. But that, I think it might be a story for another day. Yeah, well, I do that. And that's covered, you know, it, it, to some extent is covered in your book as well. Yeah. And I think, I mean, the, 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 there's a couple of things rattling through my brain because of the conversation we've had. And one is this, because we now know that the war ended because of the use of atomic weapons and of Manhattan and, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, so the, that's how the 50s and 60s and 70s shaped. It was shaped by the nuclear war and Alexander yeah. von Braun and the USA. And if... And I know it's I know this speculation game is just a, is just pointless. But if we'd ended up using the, some of the German captured nerve agents against the Japanese, might that have entered a completely different era of the chemical race becoming more important for us over the next 30, 40 years than the nuclear race? I mean, I'm, that's the thing that's floating around in my head. Yeah, um, I think we don't actually know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of what ifs if the, you know, what if that first, what, you know, I mean, history would have been fundamentally different if that, if uh, at uh, the Trinity site, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in, in New Mexico, they, 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 they light the fuse, they press the button for that, for the, uh, for the first test of a nuclear weapon and uh, it goes poof. Yeah. And it turns out to have been a wrong idea all along. Um, <laughs> where does history go with that? You know, uh that's you know you can yeah you know 
you know, I'm not a huge fan of alternative history. Uh, no. it, you know, so, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I mean, nerve agents pop up after, after the, after all this, they, they pop up in the Iran Iraq war in the, uh, the 1980s uh, for similar reasons. We ha- it's, it's a similar rationale to the Japanese versus the Chinese. The Iraqis are facing a numerically larger enemy. Okay. And are looking for ways to try to even up the score. Uh, and it's an enemy that is less well prepared with defensive equipment. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, you can make you can make a ta- you can make an argument actually that if you look at the broad history of chemical warfare, it was probably most effective in the Iran Iraq War. You know, mm. in terms of actual battles that were won and things like that, and forcing a you know, so you know, and there was probably the most you know, tactical thought being put into how it was being used and all that. And it's still quite horrific and all that. I'm not, and don't take me as any kind of apologist for chemical warfare, because I'm not. Um, but, you know, it's, like I said, you know, have, have I shared the screen here? Am I showing a picture of my book for your readers? Yeah, no, and, and I'm going to yeah. thoroughly recommend your book because it just, it, it highlighted lots of things I didn't know uh, much about at all. And, uh, and, and, and corrected my ideas of some of the stuff I did think I knew. And it just, it's a fascinating uh, book. We've only tackled the, the World War II part of it. So then the, the final question I'm going to leave you, because otherwise we'll end up going on too long, is, oh, is yeah. as you just said, you're you know, not an apologist for chemical weapons. But, you know, when, when we look at other other aspects of technology in war, and, you know, you could argue that the, 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 uh, the use of nuclear weapons has given us a safe power that we now, I mean, I'm, in, I'm just down the road from Cherbourg, France gets how much of its power from nuclear mm-hmm. power, and that's that's a good thing. And yeah. and and rockets got us to the moon. And yeah. has there been any good to come out of the chemical? I don't mean the fertilizer side of it, but I mean that chemical war for itself. Is it is there anything that we can look at and say, well, at least it's given us that? Or well, you know, I mean, we've already sort of discussed the sort of fertilizer and pesticide stuff, and it really actually, I know you don't want to go there, but it, it's very hard to disaggregate that out of the whole thing. Okay, no, I, mean, I, I, can, I can understand, yeah. Yeah, um, I'd say, I, I'd say it's, it's difficult to point to where, where the good is in this, you know, mm. uh, it's, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there with the, sim- I mentioned landmines before. I don't see much good ever having come out of landmines, and it's the same. It's the same yeah. sort of thing, uh, you know. Uh, you know, it's it, it it it's a form of it's a form of warfare that leaves a much longer after action footprint than whatever the heat of battle use is. Okay. Yeah. No. Definitely. I'd say that makes it. I've come away from your book is that you yeah. know it's uh, it it is opening a Pandora's box. That once you've opened it, you can't just put the lid back on it quickly and walk away. It's leaving yeah. this this legacy and and the, this these dangerous substances. You know, yeah. I take it myself, my friends who live in the Somme, you know, when when as I said, I said earlier, when they when they discover something mustard gas, it's something that gets people alarmed. They don't care about yeah. artillery shells; they find them every day. But as soon as mm-hmm. it mustard gas, oh, out comes the the, the fear. So. Um, and every every major chemical weapons manufacturing program turned to be an environmental and health and safety nightmare. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think I've, I've had a fascinating chat. I mean, I think we 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 all. I mean, we all, we haven't actually discussed what your background is because you know you 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 know we 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 just launched straight into talking about it. You've been working. You've worked for government, security agencies, and, and now yeah. in the private sector. You you've been dealing with this for a long, long time, haven't you? So um, I have a thirty-year career in this field, and I've sort of been sort of around the houses in it too, having been started out as a U.S. Army Chemical Corps officer, uh, then just through sort of a what I can only describe as a Forrest Gump set of circumstances, ending up in the <laughs> White House for twelve years. You know, advising the high and mighty, and then protecting the high and mighty, and then you know working in private industry uh, and all that. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I've worked in this field for 30 years. I've had enough time to think about this. Most people think about chemical weapons for five minutes. I've thought about them for three years, you know? Yeah, yeah. No. yeah. Well, that, I mean, I, that that absolutely comes across in your book. I mean, I, it, it I would say it's going to be definitive. Your book is going to be definitive. Oh, thank you, Paul. I mean, it just is. I mean, because as you, we spoke before you went live, you know, there's not many people doing this work. And, uh, yeah. and it, it, it's and it's also, I, I found it, a, 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 and I'm not going to say an enjoyable read because, I mean, it's quite horrific, but it was a very easy read. It wasn't, oh, so I didn't much. get bogged down in the science too much. I had to go yeah. put it down and go, oh my God. It it, it, it flowed like like a kind of a thriller. Um, yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I, I can't recommend it enough so well we've done our, we've done our hour and i think 
there's definitely a, a, a room to come have you on again and talk about something else and uh, okay. run, branch out and talk about the, the post-war, even though I'm a World War II TV guy, I can do something post-war, but... Uh, hey, I could give you a whole hour on chemical mortars if you got to... Uh, chemical that. mortars is, is interesting. Well, I, I am going to do a mortar show at one point. I'm yeah. trying to I'm trying to find a Panzerfaust expert now to talk about anti-tank weapons. I've got my Piat expert and I've got... Uh, a, yeah. I haven't found a Panzerfaust expert yet, but I will do. But anyway... Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. For those watch, watching, I just want to mention the fact that I've had a uh, the, the Patreon contributions I, I, I'm i taking to help fund this channel. I want to mention a few people who've, who've supported me recently. So that's Brian Fussfield, Jonathan Bending, Brian Yee, Eric Adler, Tony Suarez, Nigel Barrett, Chris Fenger, Nick Lahure, David Patterson, and John Randolph. Thank you very much for your contributions towards funding this channel. And for those who aren't funding it, you can find the link to Patreon below. And the link to Dan's book and 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 Dan is prolific on Twitter um, in in arguing against people who bring up chemical weapons in stupid ways. He's always there to jump in and say, "No, no, this is right." That and he's good at sourcing his um you know his his information. His so so follow Dan on Twitter. It's a it's an interesting read. So well, thank you very much, Dan. I've I've read. I'm not going to say I've enjoyed it because the discussing such painful ways to die and and I, before he went live. Uh, I, I said to Dan, my, one of my abiding memories as a child is my father's great uncle, Bertie, of Den Brighton, who had been a ga victim of mustard gas in the First World mm. War, and this hor horrific cough he had, and he had got his yellow handkerchief he got to hide in his pocket. So it brought up some of that, that idea, and I think that's why we need to talk about it. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible subject, but the more you talk about it, the less perhaps the less scary it becomes. And certainly I think with someone like yourself studying it, I feel we've got a better chance. So thank you very much for out there. Thank you, I Paul. feel you're out there um, protecting us with your information. So um, okay. thanks very much, Dan. Have you enjoyed it as well? Yes, and thanks for having me. And I, I'm going to sign off now because I, I can smell my supper being cooked. Oh, super. Right. Okay, well, right. thank you very much, Dan. So and thanks for watching. So I'll see you again on World War II TV. So All thanks right. very much for watching. Good evening, everybody. Keep up the good work.